The Arctic is perhaps the deadliest place on Earth. When the brutal winter grips this stunning wilderness and temperatures plummet to a lethal minus 50 degrees, everything freezes, including the countless lakes, great and small, that are everywhere in the north. It is over these lakes that a top-notch group of truckers go to work. Carving roads where none had existed before, these drivers maneuver their massive machinery over a precarious layer of ice so they can transport freight to the remotest communities in Canada's Northwest Territories. It looks like a frozen lake, it acts like a frozen lake, but it's what's underneath that frozen lake that's the unknown quantity. And that's all part and parcel of the challenge, is make sure that you get it right, because I, for one, don't want to go swimming. For anybody that's actually working in this business and traveling on the ice, there really isn't a question of if you're going to fall in, it's when you're going to fall in. He was now prepared for an even greater and more dangerous challenge. The birth, life, and death of a northern mine depends upon the costs of supplying it. Everything must be moved. Food, lumber, fuel, mining machinery, even whole houses. Trucking this freight is about a third the cost of flying it in by cargo plane. Over a decade of trucking, John Dennison, the bold Monty turned trucker, learned through trial and error how to actually build an ice road by using methods to thicken the ice to give it added strength. In addition, he perfected the building of portages, the earthen ramps that are the transitions from the lakes to the land. These are the critical links for safe and speedy truck transport. In 1962, Dennison booked his most significant and risky hauling job. Three two-ton generators needed to be retrieved from the Port Radium mine, and Dennison was willing to accept the challenge. This meant going to the mine site in the barren lands at the Arctic Circle, and then hauling the generators 450 miles south to Hay River. This route, 90% over water, had not ever been attempted by cat train. But with typical unshakable will, Dennison paved the longest ice road ever. His road-busting method, still used today, was simple and effective. To break the trail, he deployed the small and speedy bombardier, or bug. Then a V-shaped snowplow widened the path. Dennison and his men formed a convoy and inched their way up to Port Radium. The going was slow and harsh. 400 miles from anywhere, not very pleasant. Damn cold. But I don't know, that, that didn't seem to bother us that much. We all managed to have some kind of shelter. Even slight changes in temperature would snap the solid steel of their trucks, often disabling them. Temperature didn't matter. 40 below zero was nice going. 50 below is getting cold. 60 below is goddamn cold. And so if you hit something, a rock or something with it with like that, metal would break. Any time when I was scared, it was at the sound of the ice cracking. At their peak, Dennison and his ice road rangers carved a network of over a thousand miles of winter roads in a single year. During his career, he clocked tens of thousands of ice road miles and hauled countless tons of vital equipment. His bold and driven nature led him to willingly risk his own life, but he never compromised the safety of his men. Dennison passed the ice trucking legacy to Dick Robinson, a veteran trucker, who learned the rules of ice road building with Dennison. Dick Robinson built RTL Robinson Enterprises into the largest winter road trucking operation in the Northwest Territories. Today, Dick Robinson's son Marvin is the company's president and director of operations. Actually, we're on our fourth generation of trucking. My grandfather was involved in trucking 
my father, of course, and through all of the years that we've been here, we've been involved in the winter ice roads from the very first winter we were here. Over the years, RTL has taken Denison's intuitively learned techniques and applied a calculated and systematic methodology to the science of ice road building. The road's path is planned during the summer. Road engineers use a combination of bush plane observation, lake geography, and the global positioning satellite technology. Six months later, when the lakes are sufficiently frozen, the actual building of the road begins. Crews spend the month of January carving the roads according to the pre-designed plot. Two methods are used to measure the ice depth. Traditionally, the ice drill, or auger, is used to measure the ice thickness every several feet. Next, a giant plow pushes back the insulating snow. Exposing the ice to the sub-zero air ensures that it stays frozen longer. What we'll do is remove the snow back uh, as far as we can. In some cases, our roads are 150 feet wide. And what that does is allow the cold frost to penetrate the ice. Next on deck in the arsenal of road building equipment is the Argo. Its fat amphibious tires allow it to float should it crash through the ice. The Argo pulls a drag, a huge steel frame that fills the potholes with snow and evens out the surface. The magical allure of the north and a paycheck double that of regular trucking tempts drivers from all over the world to accept the unique and perilous challenges of the ice road. The very best truckers are not intimidated by the inevitable hazards. They return every winter to take on Mother Nature and test their extreme road skills. Driving the ice roads of Canada's Northwest Territories is like no other ride on Earth. Its unique challenges make it the pinnacle of all truck routes. To minimize the risks, to save lives, and to ensure a lifeline of goods heading north, RTL Robinson Enterprises put their drivers through a rigorous orientation and training program. We make sure that they understand what we call the rules of the road, and we try and explain to them what happens as you're driving on the road and on the ice. And of course we make sure they have a little bit of survival training, first aid training, so that in the event somebody does get hurt, they can look after each other. These 18 and sometimes 30 wheel behemoths run up to 550 horsepower and can be a versatile eight wheel drive. This allows for maximum flexibility over the unpredictable conditions. It's respect for your conditions. For your road, it's respect for what you're driving. It's not a matter of just putting it in one gear like you do in a motor car, put it in drive and go. You just can't do that. You give an 18 speeds and that's what they're there for. You pick the combination of speed, revs, the torque that you want, it's all down to the driver. Like we could put it in top gear and go like hell, but we wouldn't go far. Specially trained pit crews work round the clock to maintain every truck returning from and heading out to the wilderness. Each truck that comes in is specially equipped for the brutal weather. 15 miles per hour are strictly enforced to keep the pressure wave to a minimum. If the driver goes too fast, the wave gains terrific power. What you have to be aware of is the obvious reaction of that wave when it hits the shore under the ice at the other end. Last January, on the Mackenzie River, a driver lost focus and ignored the posted road shot. Got about halfway across the river when the ice wasn't thick enough and the whole unit had uh, fallen in. Another reason drivers are lured here season after season is the spectacular, even magical environment they encounter, including the mythical Northern Lights.